Thanks so much, Campbell. And I'll just add my own welcome to all of you joining us for today's online conversation with David Brooks on how to know a person. I'll also add my own thanks to our sponsors today. We really appreciate Praxis Circle, Bill and Dana Wichterman, David Campaign with the Ronald Blue Trust, as well as our anonymous senior fellow and five other guests who asked to remain anonymous in sponsoring this program. Your generosity means a lot to us and we really appreciate you. And we're delighted that so many of you are joining today. We have well over 3,000 people who have registered today and just appreciate the honor of your time and attention. I'd like to give a special shout out and welcome to our first time guests today. We have well over 400 first time registrants, as well as our nearly 300 international guests joining us from at least 38 countries that we know of, ranging from Afghanistan and Austria to Singapore and the Sudan. So welcome from across the miles and the time zones. If you haven't already done so, let us know where you're joining us from in the chat feature. It's always fun to see the community around the world. So if you are one of those first time guests or otherwise new to the work of the Trinity Forum, we seek to provide a space to engage the big questions of life in the context of faith and to offer programs like this online conversation to do so and to come to better know the author of the answers. We hope this will be a small taste of that for you today. In a new book just out this week, our guest today makes the case that one of the greatest human needs is to be paid loving attention to be known and understood, and that learning to see others calls forth and develops the best in both the subject and the beholder. The problem is we're terrible at it. On the whole, whether due to distraction or ego or overwhelm or ignorance, we either do not look, do not listen, do not care, or do not understand. And the cost is tremendous in terms of sad and lonely adults, socially and morally confused young people, and an increasingly mean and fractured society. So how might we become more attuned to others, more interested and skilled at seeing and understanding them? If, to paraphrase the poet Mary Oliver, attention is the beginning of love, how might we learn to better love our neighbors? It's one of life's both enduring and urgent questions. And so I'm so delighted to get to introduce our guest today who has wrestled with it with remarkable wisdom, humility, clarity, and charity, David Brooks. David is one of the nation's leading writers and commentators who's an op-ed columnist for the New York Times, a writer for The Atlantic, and appears regularly on PBS NewsHour. He's also the author of a number of best-selling books, including several number one bestsellers on the New York Times uh, list, including Bobos in Paradise, On Paradise Drive, The Social Animal, The Road to Character, The Second Mountain, and his wonderful new release just out earlier this week, How to Know a Person, The Art of Seeing Others Deeply and Being Deeply Seen which we've invited him here today to discuss. David, welcome. Good to be with you, Sheree. I'm very intrigued by the anonymous senior fellow who, who donated some money for to help this. I just hope it isn't my wife. Uh, can't, can't afford it. <laughs> well, we've never turned it down from my, Anne, but it's my... actually not your wife. I can, <laughs> I can tell you later who, who it was. So starting now, I want to just ask you, like, what led you to write this book? It's sort of unusual that a columnist who is you're generally used to scanning the landscape for cultural trends turns his attention uh, from the broad landscape into the eyes of another person. So what made you decide to shift your gaze from the populace to the personal? Well, first, I'm surrounded by, like we all are, by a, sort of a rising tide of barbarism and a rising tide of dehumanization. And so we all know the statistics, the rising depression, rising suicide, rising loneliness, rising bitterness, rising meanness. And it occurred to me, first, I'm not exactly helping the situation. <laughs> You've known me for a lot of years, and I'm not naturally the most socially adept human being on the face of the earth. 
And so I just wanted to get, get better. Uh, Frederick Beekner, a hero of mine and many of ours, uh, he was shut down emotionally for the first part of his life. And he, he said, in the middle of life, I learned that I, feel, I seal myself off from the pain of living and from the emotions of living. I'm sealing myself off from the holy sources of life itself. And I didn't want that to be me. And so I realized along the way that to see others well, you have to be open hearted. Uh, you have to open up your heart to other people. But that's not enough. You need skills. And so you need the skill of really listening well, being a great conversationalist, disagreeing well, sensing anxiety somebody, in somebody's voice and asking them about it, hosting uh, so that everybody feels included. And so over the course of the four years I wrote the book, I wanted to be more open-hearted <laughs> and just a more emotionally available person. I wanted to know more about human nature so I would know what I'm looking at. But really, I just wanted to learn the skills, how to be concretely considerate in daily circumstances of life. Yeah. You know, you, um, you describe just paying attention, which seems like such a simple act is actually a really profound, um, moral and creative act. And, you know, even just so our, our last online conversation, we hosted Kurt Thompson. And one of the things Kurt has said, I know, you know, Kurt, um, is that really the paying attention to what we pay attention to is usually the start of the spiritual disciplines too, uh, that yeah, there's something that sure. really, uh, affects us in terms of the decisions about where we pay attention. So what, given all your research, do you find, um, well, why is it that that simple act of paying attention to others is so, is so powerful? What is it about uh, that that kind of brings forth change in, in us as well as, as others? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you a story to illustrate how powerful attention is. So I'm, I'm in Waco, Texas. And I'm having breakfast with a woman, a 93-year-old woman named LaRue Dorsey. And she presents herself to me as this tough, intimidating woman who was a teacher most of her career. And she said, I love my students enough to discipline them. And I was a little intimidated by her. And into the diner walks a mutual friend of ours named Jimmy Durrell. And Jimmy is a pastor. He pastors a church under the bridge, uh, which is for homeless people. And he comes up to our table and he grabs Mrs. Dorsey by the shoulders and shakes her way harder than you should shake a 93-year-old. And he says to her, Mrs. Dorsey, Mrs. Dorsey, you're the best, you're the best, I love you, I love you. And that tough, intimidating drill sergeant suddenly turned into a bright, eye-shining nine-year-old girl. And so the attention you cast on a person changes who they will be and who they will become. Uh, and so why that's important to me is not only that Jimmy's a warmer personality than I am, but Jimmy is a pastor. And so he sees anybody anybody, he's seeing someone made in the image of God. He's looking into the face of God. He's looking at a person who has a soul of infinite value and dignity, a soul so important that Jesus was willing to die for that person. And so I tell people, you can be Christian, Jewish, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, but approaching people with that level of reverence and respect is an absolute precondition for knowing them well. And you've got to know that the person in front of you is not a problem to be solved, but in a, a a wonder that will never be gotten to the bottom of. And in that first act of meeting someone, everyone, when we meet someone, we're unconsciously asking ourselves a question. Am I a person to that person? Am I a priority to those, that person? And the answers to those questions will be expressed in, the, in people's gaze before they're expressed in words. So that first act of attention, as Iris Murdoch says, we want to cast a just and loving attention on others. And I can't do a whole Trinity Forum event without citing the chosen. But if you look at that show, the way Jesus looks at everybody else in that show is actually masterfully done, because we want to look at other people with those eyes. You know, I think, um, well, both of us, probably all of us have had some kind of story where someone saw something in us and kind of by, you know, through that attention, but also by naming it kind of helped call it forth. Um, but you have said that the act of actually seeing each other with love and um, a just and loving attention affects not only um, those who we behold, but also affects mm -hmm. the beholder. Uh, yeah. I'd love for you to say a little bit more about what that means. How yeah. uh, How is it that there's <laughs> uh, there's truth, goodness, and beauty in the eye of the beholder? Right. right. Yeah. So it's when I ask people, tell me about a time you've been seen, they tell me shot with bright eyes and joy in their face. They tell me about time somebody totally got them. Because seeing someone, if, if I see potential in you, you, in you, you'll see potential in yourself. If I beam my attention on you, you'll blossom. And so it's just super powerful to feel seen. 
but it's also powerful and fantastic to feel like you're the seer, like you look at another person. And so I'm sitting here right in my living room. And about two years ago, or I guess about two years ago, uh, I was sitting across the table from where the laptop is. And I was reading a boring book, which is what I get paid to do. Uh, and my wife, Ann Snyder, senior fellow at the Trinity Forum and editor of Comment Magazine, uh, walks in the door, which is that right over there. And she, the door is open and she opens the door and she's standing there in the doorway. And it's summertime and the sun is coming in behind her. And I look up from my book and she doesn't even notice that I'm there because that's the kind of charisma I have. Uh, and and, she, and she's looking at an orchid that we keep on a table by the door. And I look at her and I have this sensation come across my mind, which was, I know her. I know her through and through. And if you had asked me what I knew about her at that moment, it's not like her personality traits or, or any adjectives I would use to describe her to a person. It was like the harmonies of her music, the ebb and flow of her being, sort of the incandescence of her personality, the occasional fierceness, the occasional insecurities. It was as if I was almost not seeing her, but I was seeing out from her. Uh, and if you really want to understand other people, you have to see the world a little from their point of view. And it was that just a moment of human contact. And it just felt delicious. Like, I know her, I know her. And if you had asked me what word I would use to describe how I was seeing her at that moment, the word I would use is behold. I wasn't inspecting her. I wasn't observing her from detached perspective. I was just beholding her. And it, it was like a, just wonder at this other human being. And I mentioned this story about a year later to a, an older couple, and they said, that's what I, we do with our grandkids. We just behold them. And it's just an appreciative way of welcoming somebody's whole presence into your life and into your mind. And it was so much fun. I, I remember it vividly to this day. Well, incandescent is a good adjective for Anne, but um, you know, in, in some ways, as well, it's a wonderful story and as joyful and delightful as it is to behold people, it seems, well, at least you tell us, we're awfully bad at doing it. Um, and it really, it was kind of remarkable. You mentioned different uh, studies. I'm going to cite some of these that strangers accurately read each other only around 20% of the time, close friends and family only around 30 to 35% of the time. And moreover, the people who are just absolutely awful at it think that they are as good as the people who are actually more skilled. Why are we so bad at beholding when it is so generative and joy giving? Yeah. Well, first we're, um, we're, we're egotistical. So we're busy not think we're busy thinking about ourselves so we don't think about other people uh second some of us have so much anxiety in our heads there's so much noise up there they don't have time for other people some people just can't appreciate that there other people have different viewpoints they think everybody sees the world the way they do and if they don't and if the other people don't there's something wrong with them there's a, a little story i tell about a guy who was on one side of the river and there was a woman on the other side of the river and she shouts at him how do i get to the other side of the river and he shouts back at her you are on the other side of the river and so he couldn't put herself in her viewpoint and see. And so that's part of it. Partly we're shy, you know, and we don't ask, we don't ask. Uh, and so I've, I have a, a friend of mine named Naomi Wei who teaches seventh grade boys how to do interviewing so they can become journalists, student journalists. And the first time she ever did this, she um, sat in the front of the room and she said, okay, you guys shoot some questions at me. I'll answer truthfully, whatever you ask. And so the first question from one boy was, are you married? And she said, no. Second question from another boy, are you divorced? Yes. Third question, do you still love him? And she's, her eyes go open wide. And then she says, yes. And they say, does he know? By now she's crying. Do your kids know? Like kids will ask the direct question. They will go right there. But then as we get older, we get a little shy, sometimes appropriately shy. Uh, but in my view, we're too shy. And so I've learned that the qual one of the qualities of your conversations will be the quality of your questions. And so when you're getting to know someone, I ask people where they're from. I love to get them talking about their childhood. They love, people love to talk about their childhood. And you learn so much about them just from, you know, what town was it in? What was your family like? And sometimes I'll ask, uh, like, we have a mutual friend who I won't out him here, but I once asked him, 
what's your favorite unimportant thing about him, about you? What's your favorite unimportant thing about you? And he's a, a prestigious academic. And the amount of reality trashy TV show that guy watches was crazy. Like, so I learned that by asking that. And then as you get to know people better, you can ask them questions that take them out of their daily existence and get them to think new about themselves. So if this chapter, if this five years is a chapter in your life, what's this chapter about? It gets people talking about what are the themes, what are their main life tasks, or what transition are you in the middle of? What crossroads are you at? We're usually in the thinking about some transition. And so you have you ask a big question like that, you get a big conversation, and it makes it a meaningful conversation, whether it's just friends or colleagues. Uh, we have a mutual friend. I won't out them either, but I don't think they'd mind. But she says, our, um, our friends, we like friends who are lingerable. People you just want to linger with. And that's good company. And I, a lot of it comes from a, a, just a conversation that's going sensationally where you really are learning things about each other. Uh, one other topic that I used recently and Anne thought it was a little pretentious, which it was, but I asked anyway, and it turned into a good conversation, which was, how do your ancestors show up in your life? And so there was a Dutch family there. They talked about their Dutch heritage. There was a black couple there. They talked about African-American heritage. I talked about my Jewish ancestry. And it, our lives are affected by things stretching back generations and the way we look at the world, our culture, our heritage. And so it's just fun to explore that topic. Uh, and so when you have a big conversation like that, you leave it feeling a little more seen. Yeah, I can imagine. I almost feel now like I need to ask you, like, what big transition you were in, in the middle of your life? <laughs> you I don't have you, I've, 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 I'm <laughs> Becoming a Baha'i. No, I don't know. <laughs> You know, it, it was interesting that you again kind of give a stat. You're you give a lots of stats, but really that uh, you estimate only around thirty percent of people are natural question askers, and we don't really get a lot of training in, in sort of how to do that. Uh, and you also called asking good questions a moral practice. Um, so, how would you, if, if someone came to you, be like David? You do this for a living. You ask lots of interesting questions. I have no idea where to start. Um, what would you tell them? How do you ask a morally formative question? Yeah, I mean, I, I do ask questions for a living, but we all have conversations for a living. And the sad thing is there's no place to go to get taught this stuff. And you don't have to ask, uh, you know, one thing that makes us shy is we're the, under the illusion that people don't want to be asked. And there's in the book, I cite a guy named Dan McAdams who studies how people tell their life stories. And he has people come into his research lab and he asks them, tell me about the high points of your life. Tell me about the low points of your life. Tell me about the turning points. And after a few hours, he hands them a little check to compensate them for their time. And they push the check back, some of them, and say, I'm not taking money for this. This has been one of the best afternoons of my life. And so I have found again and again, if you respectfully ask somebody to tell you their story, no one has ever asked them. And they get such immense pleasure out of it. And they... They love to talk and it, it it just makes you curious. And so it's not hard to get people going. Monica Guzman is a journalist and she has a question, why you? Like, why was it you who felt compelled to run for school board? Why was it you who decided to start that company? And then gets people talking about their desires, their motivations, the things they dream about. And that's not a hard question to ask. Uh, and so these are, and you know, relatively easy questions to get people going and I, you know, I have a friend who hires people for a living and his, one of his questions is, uh, who are you in high school and how has that changed? Because uh, his theory is that whoever you were in high school, you're carrying a little of that, those insecurities around with you right now, uh, your sense of where your social location, stuff like that. And so he's fantastic at hiring and he hires for what he calls spirit of generosity. And he says, you can tell someone's spirit of generosity when, as they talk about their childhood, who loved them, who did they love? Uh, and that's as part of a job hiring process is learning about skills. Mm -hmm. And when we have to let someone go from any employment, it's never because it's rarely 11% of the time it's because they lack technical skills. 89% of the time it's they weren't a team player. They weren't calm in a crisis. They weren't generous to colleagues. And if we're going to hire someone, marry someone, befriend someone, raise a kid, you just got to be a lot better at, at seeing them accurately. Mm -hmm. Your friend is probably someone that you would refer to in your book, at least as an illuminator. And you have sort of divided different approaches to uh, beholding people or paying attention as uh, between diminishers and illuminators. Uh, what's What are the different practices of diminishers and illuminators? And how can we 
tell if we're being a diminisher when we should aspire to be an illuminator. Yeah. Well, diminishers, first, they don't ask. So if you're not a question asker, you're probably a diminisher. Secondly, um, they uh, stereotype. And so they have labels. And thirdly, they do a thing called stacking. And stacking is when if you learn one fact about a person, you make a whole series of assumptions that you think must also be true of that person. And so you learn somebody's a Trump supporter, then suddenly you've made all these stereotypical assumptions about that person. But those are almost never true. I, I heard about a Trump supporter who was a, a lesbian biker who converted to Sufi Islam after surviving a plane crash. Like, what stereotype does she fit into? And I find most people like that. They're just way more complicated than their stereotypes. And then illuminators make you feel lit up. I quote a bar, uh, E.M. Foster was an English novelist lived about 100 years ago. And his biographer said he had a kind of inverse charisma. He listened to you with such intensity that you had to be your best, sharpest, and most practiced self. So that's just intense listening. I tell in the book the story, maybe apocryphal, of Jenny Jerome. And Jenny Jerome went to, was an, he, she later became Winston Churchill's mom. But when she was a young woman in Victorian England, she was once seated next to uh, William Gladstone, the prime minister, at a dinner. And she left that dinner thinking that Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. And then a couple of weeks later, she happens to be seated next to Benjamin Disraeli, Disraeli uh, Gladstone's great political rival. And she left that dinner with Disraeli thinking that she was the cleverest person in England. So if you can make somebody else feel like they're the cleverest person in the country, you've done your job. Um, and another example of an illuminator is uh, it occurred in Bell Labs, the legendary research facility. And so there's, there was some researchers were way more creative than others. And they wanted to know why. And they said, was it IQ? No. Was it educational attainment? No. They found out their most creative uh, researchers were in the habit of having breakfast or lunch with an electrical engineer named Harry Nyquist. And Harry would ask them about their, their problems, get inside their head, sort of think along with them. And together, they thought through their problems and came to creative solutions. So Harry Nyquist was an illuminator. He got inside his colleagues' heads and just helped them think through their own problems uh, and making everybody better. So um, one of the things that you have mentioned in your book is that uh, there's a problem not only with our personal a kind of sense of lacking illuminators, but uh, kind of on a population level, we're kind of a lacking illuminators as well, that, um, you know, there's study after study showing that Americans are lonelier, sadder, murder rates, gun sales, hate crimes are surging, social trust, charitable giving is, is declining. Um, and you conclude that people are no longer trained in how to treat others with kindness. But in reading all of that, one of the things that occurred to me is how much of it is that we don't know how to treat others with kindness yeah. as opposed to the we don't want to you know we yeah. have found benefits to trying to one up or dominate or even humiliate others and it it's been working for us on an individual level if, if even if not on a societal one yeah well i don't think it has been working i think the reason 36 percent of americans feel persistently lonely is because we have they haven't been trained and if you don't know how to start a conversation uh, you're not going to want to do it. You're not going to want to do something you think you're going to fail at. And so uh, I don't know whether it's the churches or the schools or wherever, just these basic skills, how to host a party effectively, uh, how to ask for forgiveness and offer forgiveness. Uh, these are just basic skills that somehow we're not teaching. And I, I do think it leads to the immiseration of lots and lots of people. Like one of the weird statistics is the number of people who say they have no close friends has gone up by four times in the last 20 years. Like what, what is going on with our country? And so one of the reasons I think it's skill-based is because people just don't know how to interact. But then I just saw a study a couple of weeks ago, they looked at the number of men who have never asked a woman out on a date. And the number is super high and they wanted to know what was the, why they hadn't asked the women out on a date. And it was low flirting skills. <laughs> and so we don't think of flirting as a skill you have to learn. But if you can't flirt, it's going to be hard to like, approach a romantic love interest. Um, flirting is a thing. Uh, and so I, that's why I think teaching the skills is so important. And then more broadly, and I'll just speak personally, you know, as this wall of, of depression, suicide, loneliness, anger, meanness has been rising, it can seem naive to be like me, to think, oh, we should all know each other. We should all understand each other. 
But in my view, I've decided to adopt this defiant humanism. <laughs> like in a world of loneliness and people are attacking, I'm going to be the one who's going to lead with respect. I'm going to lead with curiosity. And I'm going to argue that it's the most practical thing you can do is to try to open up your eyes and try to understand another human being and make them feel seen, heard, and understood. That is, to me, is the only way you're going to break down the cycle of misapprehension and hostility. And since we're on Trinity form, if I could be a little explicitly religious here, Jesus lived in a time of bitter hostility and revolution. And the model he sets for us is of someone who, who looks at all this rising tide of hatred with the gentle eyes of love and looks at each person with the gentle eyes of love. Uh, and so we're sort of called to do that, to try to do this. And we're going to do it as well as Jesus did it, but we can do it a little. And when you go look in, in the Bible, especially after writing the book I've been writing, you realize how many dramas of recognition there are, how many times somebody was not recognized. And obviously the disciples don't recognize the risen Christ, Esau and Isaac and the birthright. And even in the, the Good Samaritan, the, a lot of people see the injured guy on the side of the road but only the Samaritan really sees him. And the Bible is always giving us these dramas where somebody didn't see well. And those failures, when people misunderstand someone, those are failures of the heart, not failures of the head. And so we're really given a lot of instruction in the Bible on, on how to see and the errors of misseeing. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it's interesting in that, you know, loneliness obviously is very much on the rise. And, you know, you, you've pointed out that lonely people also often, not always, but often tend to be more aggressive and fearful. Um, and the loneliness drives a lot of that, so, such that the people that we, that most need um, that kind of loving attention are probably the least likely to get it. Uh, but, you know, there, I think there's also a, a tension, which is, you um, you know, on one hand, we're called, we are at Christians are called to love our enemies, not just, you know, merely our antagonist. Uh, but at the same time, there's also presumably a need for certain, certain boundaries um, around enemies and antagonists. And, you know, even as a, a colonist, you, I'm sure, have far more people who want or even demand your attention um, than, you, than you can provide. How do you think about just the inevitable tension between the call to love our neighbor and our enemy and the reality of uh, very finite uh, attention as well as potential um, potential harm from some others. Yeah. yeah. Well, first on the, sometimes you're just overwhelmed. Like I, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm about to go on a book tour. So I'm going to travel around the country talking about my book for the next um, uh, three months or so. And I'm thinking of all the plane rides and train rides I'm going to take. And do I have to talk to a person next to me every single time? I don't know. That seems like a lot. <laughs> like when you're on book tour, you just want to do a shutdown and relax <laughs> in between talking. So we all face these normal barriers. But I do think we can get better at sort of tamping down the efficiency mindset that some of us use to carry through every day of our life. And so, for example, if, if I'm pulling to the gas station, I, th I think to myself, oh, I've got 90 seconds while I'm pumping gas. I can get two emails done. That's just a horrible way to think. Like I've got this productivity clock in my head. And if I think that way, then when I'm picking up my kids at school or, you know, hanging out with somebody, I'm going to still have that clock in my head. Of course, I'm not going to be lingerable. Of course, I'm going to want our relationship to be um, efficient. And so I've got to tamp down that efficiency and say, no, I'm going to stay with this right, this person. And I've learned, you know, Treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. And so it's going to be 100% or 0%. I'm not going to multitask you, another human being. And I've learned from our friend and Trinity Forms friend, Andy Crouch, uh, mm -hmm. to be a loud listener. And I mentioned Andy in the book, because when you talk to Andy, if people know him from the events he's been on here, um, he's, he's like a Pentecostal church. He's like, uh-huh, yep, yep, preach, yes, amen, amen, I agree, I agree, amen, amen. And I'm like, love talking to that guy. So I want to be a little more of that. But as you say, there are some people who are beyond the boundaries. So if you're an illuminator or wannabe, and somebody is persistently a diminisher, and it's just going to stereotype, ignore, and attack, well, there's not much you can do about that. And you can try to release a little vulnerability to see if they'll respond in kind. But you know, I'm not naive enough to think that 
if I was in the room with members of Hamas, which I've been in those, those rooms, that somehow I should try to understand them and everything will be peaceful between us. Some people are just genocidal monsters and you got to protect yourself. Uh, but I do think most people, and I've been in Palestinian homes, there were, we may disagree profoundly about a bunch of stuff, but there's genuine graciousness and warmth in the home. Uh, or Trump supporters, I'm not a big Donald Trump supporter, but I've had a zillion conversations with Trump supporters, some in my own family, that have been deep, meaningful, um, real great friendships. And sometimes there are certain subjects we won't talk about just to keep the friendship alive, but that's super easy to do. Uh, and if I meet a Trump supporter and I say, you know, what was, what was your best job ever? Like, what was the best job you read? Uh, suddenly they'll tell me a story. And if they tell me how they lost that job because it got shipped overseas or immigration or whatever, then suddenly I understand where their head is at vis-a-vis -vis Donald Trump. I, I may not agree with their voting choices, but I, it's a legitimate standpoint. Yeah. Uh, you also, and it was really one of the most, I think, kind of gripping and poignant parts of your work, uh, describe the experience of trying to, to see deeply, to connect with your best friend from childhood, um, Pete, who was was caught in uh, depression and the world that he inhabited seemed very difficult to uh, behold or, or understand. Um, how so many of us who are watching, you know, do have close friends or loved ones who um, at some point in their lives seem to be occupying an alternative reality that's very hard to understand. How do you learn to behold and see deeply someone who yeah. seems to be caught um, in, in that kind of despairing alternate reality? Yeah. Well, this is yet another skill that we're not taught. And I am a reasonably well-educated person. You think somewhere along the way, somebody would have taught me, how do you sit with someone who's suffering from depression? But I didn't know. And so for the first 57 years of his life, Pete had this wonderful life of, he was an eye surgeon. He was a, had a wonderful wife, two great kids, uh, lived up in Connecticut. We met when we were 11. And basically played basketball for 40 years of our lives together. Um, and then Pete got hit with depression. And I didn't really understand back then what depression was. And this was 2019. And I since learned from one of our friends, Michael Gerson, M Mike said that depression is a, man a malfunction in the instrument you use to perceive reality. So Pete was not seeing reality accurately. And he, he like Mike, had these obsessive voices in his head, uh, no one would miss if you're gone, you're worthless, you're dragging everybody down. And so that's the reality Pete was living with for three years. And in the beginning, I didn't know how to talk to him. And I wanted to say something that would help. And so the first mistake I made was I tried to give him ideas for how to snap out of depression. So I said, you know, you used to go on service trips to Vietnam, why don't you do that again? You found them so rewarding. And I learned later that telling giving somebody ideas about how to go out, get out of depression is just a sign that you don't un, you don't understand what depression is because it's not ideas they're lacking it's energy then i made another mistake which was positive reframing i tried to remind him of all the wonderful things about his life and that is negative too that has a bad effect too because it shows that he's not enjoying the things that are palpably enjoyable so there must be something wrong with him gradually over covid our phone calls i learned um, just to be present, just to recognize the awfulness of the situation, be present, show I'm not going anywhere. And then I think if I had to do it again, I would, um, I would first uh, have sent more touches, like just a little text here and there, just say, I'm thinking of you, no response necessary. I'm just thinking of you. Uh, then I, I may have said, you know, I'm, I admire your courage because you're still here. You're in a lot of pain. You've been in a lot of pain for three years and you're still here. I admire your courage. And then I've learned from Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, when he was counseling people who were contemplating suicide, he said, life has not stopped expe expecting things of you. Life has not stopped expecting things of you. And that seems a little harsh to tell someone who's like contemplating, but Frankl says, no, they have to know they're here for a reason and they, they have a lot of good they can do in the world. And later I read a, a quote, I was given a quote by a friend of mine, a pastor named Chris Davis, um, a, a quote from Thornton Wilder, the playwright. And he said, uh, without your wound, where would your power be? It's mm -hmm. your very low, your low voice trembles into the hearts of men because of the wounds you carry. 
uh, in love service uh, only wounded soldiers can serve. So it, it was Pete, and for somebody who's suffering, it is their very suffering that gives them credibility to reach into the hearts of other sufferers and to sit with them and be a comfort to them. And so that's a power that comes from that strength. And I wish I'd reminded Pete of all these things. Having said that, I don't think there's anything ultimately I could have said that would have made a difference. He ended up succumbing to suicide about a year and a bit ago uh, because the monster was just too big for him uh, and it was going to be too big for us. It was just, it's a monster, this thing. Um, so there's nothing I could have said that would have changed things, but uh, things I wish I'd said just to be a, a better presence along the way. We're going to turn to questions from our viewers in a second, but before we do, uh, obviously the process of immersing yourself in all of this material, not just the research, but also the theologians, the philosophers and the like, whose works you, yeah, you summarize and th synthesize um, in essentially helping uh, others to better love and see our neighbors. How did it change you? Uh, I'd be interested if there's any practices or disciplines you've adopted or even just changes you see in your own practice of seeing others? I, well, I think I am a more open to people in stranger situations, but I hope I'm, I have conversations that are, are deeper and better and more memorable for all involved. Uh, and I hope I re reflect back, a, I hope I cast what Iris Murat called a just and loving attention on people that I, I do come to revere each person as this soul of infinite value and dignity. And I hope I'm more emotionally open. I think I am. I, uh, I'll tell you two stories, one of which is in the book, one of which isn't. But the one in the book is involves me name dropping. But uh, I've been interviewed by Oprah twice in my life in 2014 and 2019. And after the 2019 interview, she comes up to me and says, you know, I've rarely seen someone change so much in middle age. You, you were so emotionally blocked before. And so that was a good moment for me that I, I, you know, she should know she's Oprah. Like, so I, I'm making some progress as a human being. The other story is um, I was at a conference recently and we were at a, a church and we, everyone was handed out a song sheet with lyrics of some love song. And we had to pick a stranger and sing the song into their eyes while gazing into their eyes of a stranger, this scappy love song. And if you had asked me had done that 10 years ago, my head would have exploded. <laughs> But I did it. I was out there for the emotional openness. So I did it. And I, it took me like six months to recover, but still. <laughs> uh, uh, so, but I, I, I think hopefully, especially if we got us guys, you soften in middle age and you, you get a little more emotionally open. So I hope I'm, I think I'm that way. Well, there's lots of questions that are piling up. So we'll just dive right in. Trisha Hickey asked, how does one start the cycle of knowing and being known when they've spent years building up walls due to hurts and life? Yeah, well, that this is the, what Frederick Buechner teaches us because he was hurt by life and he, he built up a lot of walls. Uh, and so, you know, one of it is just, uh, I find that it helps me to have a, a spiritual and emotional book going at just before you do the more complicated interacting with another person. Uh, a big book for me was Sheldon Van Auken's A Severe Mercy. Uh, and I read that book on a plane. It's a very sad book. And I cried and the flight attendants were worried about me. Uh, and, and so <laughs> just even that for me, because I'm pretty inward and pretty much a bookish reader, to sort of loosen myself up with um, with literature uh, was just tremendously valuable. And I have a friend, when he's in a cranky mood, his wife asks him, do you have a novel going? Because I think you need to be reading a novel because you get cranky when you have no novel going. So <laughs> that's one thing. But then I think, you know, just the normal um, occasions of life, uh, just to ask that extra question. And so I, I, I've learned that you, we, we all, some of us ask questions, but then when somebody has a pro bringing a problem to us, it's useful to ask three or four questions about the problem and then ask another three or four more questions than you think. Tell me more about that. What am I missing? And I've found it's amazing how often when you ask somebody three times or five times, how each time the answers get bigger and different and better. And so a, a good conversation is not people making statements at each other. <laughs> a good conversation is a, is a group exploration. And it doesn't have to be personal, but it's like, what, there's something intriguing and you said something that's interesting. Let me expand on that. 
And maybe you could expand on what I said. And then it just it becomes fun. Then you're just, uh, you're learning together. And you don't have to get super personal to do that, to have that kind of explorative conversation. Stone soup, almost, of yeah. exploration. Okay, I'm going to combine two somewhat related questions. Alan Seelinger asked, can you comment on how knowing others and being known can help reduce animosity towards those with whom we disagree? And Kevin Offner asked, can you give us some insight on how to engage someone face-to-face -face with whom you have strong, all caps, disagreements? Someone that you know is you strongly disagree with on something that you think is vitally important. How can you yeah. ex express respect and appreciation in a way that's genuine? Yeah. Well, I have a chapter in the book on hard conversations, and those are conversations across class difference, religious difference, ideological difference, any kind of difference in disagreement. And often when you're in those hard conversations, the, people are coming at you with critique and blame in their voice. And your your first instinct is to say, well, it's not me. I'm not the problem here. I'm one of the good guys. Or here's what I'm doing. Here's how I see things. And I've learned your first job is to resist that hesitant, that temptation to get defensive. And my first job when I'm being attacked by someone who really disagrees and who we, who and I disagree, my first job is to stand in their standpoint. So that's to say, I'm, I really need to understand your point of view. So tell me again, this is, goes back to the three things time. Tell me again, tell me again, what am I missing here? The Scottish have a, a word, ken, that we have the phrase, that's beyond my ken. So the ken is the in naval navigation. It's the part of the ocean you can see wherever you are. It's your little area. So my job is to stand in their ken. So I really understand that point of view. And I may never agree, but the very fact that I've asked three or four questions about it communicates respect. And there's a great book called Crucial Conversations that says, in any conversation, respect is like air. When it's present, no one notices. When it's absent, it's all anybody can think about. So at least I've shown respect. The second thing I've learned is that every conversation takes place on two levels. There's the official conversation that we're normally nominally talking about. Then there's the under conversation, which is the flow of emotion between us as we're speaking. And so every comment I make, then I'm making you feel either more safe or more threatened. And the same, you're doing that to me. So if my comments can make you feel more safe, then everything else we say will be a, at least a little more humane. And then two final things. One is uh, keep the gem statement in the center. If you and I disagree about something, there might be something deep down that we actually do agree upon. If my brother and I are fighting over health care, our dad's health care. We, we might disagree about that, but we really both want what's best for our dad. So if we can take that thing we both agree on, that gem statement, and keep returning to it, then we save the rel relationship as we're in the middle of a fight. Uh, and then the final one I'll give is find the disagreement under the disagreement. So if you and I disagree about tax policy or something, or even a marketing plan at a company, there's probably a philosophical reason or a personal reason we're disagreeing. So instead of just repeating the things at each other, let's have an exploration to find out what, what really is the philosophical difference that's caused us to come out on different sides of this issue. And again, we're at a joint exploration. And so these are all occasions when you can take bitter disagreement and at least open up channels of communication. Will it always work? And believe me, I've been attacked in public by people who hate my point of view on one issue or another. And I do not always rise to the occasion. <laughs> I sometimes sink to the volley of anger and anger. But I have found 90% of the time, if someone viciously attacks you and you email them back or you say, hey, can I buy a beer, you a beer? Immediately, everything changes. From bitterness, as soon as you show a little modicum of respect, suddenly they're like, yeah, let's talk about that. So a question from Don Morgan, who asked, what social structures, platforms, and institutions might facilitate the kinds of deep conversations you're talking about? Yeah, first, um, I remember somehow as I'm listening to the question, I'm reminded, if anybody remembers, there was a book called About the Tiger Mom by Amy Chua. Uh, and she was like, how to raise smart and high achieving kids. And she was, and one of the things she said, I don't let my kids my daughters go to sleepovers with other teenage girls because I want them to do something cognitively demanding like practice the violin. And my reaction on reading that, 
believe me, there's nothing more cognitively demanding than going on a sleepover with a bunch of 13 year old girls. Like that is the most <laughs> cognitively demanding thing you can possibly yeah. do. Lots of dynamics. It's just social <laughs> dynamics. Um, and so I do think those kinds of encounters, which kids are not getting because of phones, uh, are one training, one way we train. The second thing I think is um, is extended families that back in the day when people had three or four generation families, there was a lot of, again, a lot of dynamics to negotiate. Uh, and so you had to go to aunts, uncles, grandparents, uh, cousins. And so that was, seems to me, intimate training in this kind of advanced social skills. And then I do think um, churches played a bigger role than they do now. And I think schools played a bigger role. And it, up until 20 or 30 years ago, it was a norm for schools to think our job here is moral formation. That's our job here. It's not to get our kids into Harvard or Yale. Our job is to make people better versions of themselves and to be considerate and part of being considerate. And in my sense, the first part of being considerate and being a moral person is paying the right kind of attention to other people. Everything else follows you paying the right kind of attention. Uh, and usually, as the philosopher Iris Murdoch said, we pay attention to others in self-centered, degrading ways. Uh, and if we can grow by looking, as she writes, then we've become morally transformed. Uh, and I, I've quoted Jesus already, but I'll quote a higher authority, uh, which is Ted Lasso. Uh, and so Ted was, um, if anybody saw that program, he's asked in season one, um, uh, what's your goal as a soccer coach? And his answer is, I just want to make my players better versions of, of themselves on and off the field. And that's, that's moral formation. And I think it's our inability to do moral formation has caused this deterioration in our inability to relate to another in an intelligent way. You mentioned both Iris Murdoch and churches, and we have questions on both. So Rupert Mur uh, Harris asked, how has Iris Murdoch influenced you? Yeah, a great deal. Um, and, you know, I, I, I learned that I, I was influenced by her uh, through three women who I wrote about in the current issue of Comment. She, Iris Murdoch was influenced powerfully by Simone Weil. And so I wrote about Simone Weil, Eddie Hillisom, and Edith Stein. And these were three women born in Jewish homes, caught in the Holocaust. Uh, and so they're living in the horrors of World War II, one in France, one in Germany, one in Amsterdam. And they're surrounded by barbarism. And the men are fighting. And Eddie Hillisom, who was the one living in Amsterdam, uh, started out the war as a self-centered brat, basically. But she became more compassionate as she watched people getting shipped out to the death camps. And as conditions got worse and the war got more brutal, she got more gentle, more humane, more, more other-centered. And by the end of the war, she was serving in a death camp, and but she was a, a source of joy for others. And people re recounted her as this generous, unbelievably generous person. And her biographer wrote about her that she grew by paying close attention to others. The crick of the neck, the anxiety in their voice, the hunger in their eyes. Pay close attention to others and serve those needs. And you see this woman in her diaries over the course of four years in these horrible circumstances, really rising into some sort of saint-like presence almost. And Edith Stein, the same thing happened to her, and she literally was canonized as a saint. And Simone Weil was the same. Simone Weil said, uh, attention is the essential moral act and that prayer is a form of attention. Uh, and it's that kind of attention. I'm reminded of a quote I saw from Mother Teresa was interviewed by Dan Rather. And he said, when you pray, uh, uh, what do you tell God? And she said, well, I don't really tell him anything. I just listen to him. And he said, well, what is God telling you? And she said, well, God is just listening too. We're just listening to each other. And she says, if you can't explain, understand that I can't explain it to you. And so I, I do think that it is that act of attention that these three women really found central, which then Simone Weil wrote, which then Iris Murdoch turned into a philosophy, that male philosophers build these vast moral systems. Think of Immanuel Kant. But a lot of the men are blind to the systems of care that are right around them. And Edith Murdoch, uh, Iris Murdoch, and Edith Stein, and Eddie Hillisim, and Simone Weil, they were attentive to the systems of care in the daily acts of daily life, even amidst the horrors of war. And I found them very inspiring. That's beautiful. 
So Nathan Swanson asks, how can local congregations or other places of worship help foster the deep conversations among members so that they sense that they're known by others in the congregation? Yeah, I do think a lot of it is having conversations like that are going to happen after our session here. I mean, and make them storytelling conversations. Uh, I, I never ask people, what do you believe about this? I say, how'd you come to believe that? And suddenly they're telling me about a person who's shaped their values, who's important, or some experience they had. Uh, and, you know, the best ones, you know, the, there are all these curricula you can have. And I'm, if you read my book, you'll get a bunch of questions. But a lot of it is just being natural and hanging out with each other. Uh, and especially in times of, of suffering. Uh, and in those moments, when somebody is grieving, their mental models of the world have collapsed because their mental models were framed about the husband or wife who they just lost or the kid they just lost. And they're in the moment, to the, these moments where your mental models are reshifting are moments of intense pain because it's just painful to go through one of these transitions of you had this connection, suddenly that connection is gone. If you lose a husband, you're the fibers of your brain are reaching out to him, but he's not there. And it's just intensely painful. So you, sitting through somebody as they process that grief, I put in the book a story, of, and this was in a chapter of how to sit with those who are suffering, um, a woman uh, who lost her husband. And a, she's walking out of her apartment building, I think in Washington, and she's um, a, a neighbor who knows what's happened, screams at her from across the street. And she says, you'll think, you'll think you're sane, but you're not. And what she means is you don't understand how grief is going to destabilize you over the next year. And she said, that was so profound because within six months I was, I was at the CVS and I was screaming at the employees because they were playing, You'll, he'll be home for Christmas on the sound system. And I knew my husband would not be home for Christmas. So I started screaming at them. And it was a form of central temporary derangement. And so sitting with someone, and this is what churches and synagogues and mosques are great at. They, when somebody's in suffering, people know to show up. And I worry about all these people who are de-churched. They may have friends, but they don't. people don't know to show up if there's no institution around them. And I, I'm afraid we're going to see a lot of that kind of loneliness because people are under-institutionalized. David Richards asks, some people have learned that it isn't safe for them to be open or vulnerable and sharing about themselves. An illuminator may have the best intentions, asking thoughtful and seeing questions, but the receiver might see those as intrusive or threatening. Do you have thoughts on how to approach conversations with that awareness? Yeah, the, there's a quote in the book from um, T.H. Lawrence that you should approach um, somebody the way you would approach a, a fawn in the forest with a complete absence of will, complete patience, uh, and you just need to take your time. And that process, you can't really have a lot of these deep conversations unless trust has been established. So the way trust is established, there's a chapter on accompaniment, which is a Pope Francis comment or concept that he talks about a lot. And accompaniment is just another centered way of being in the world. And so uh, we think of the way a pianist accompanies a singer. You're just paying attention to them, trying to make the singer shine. And so the easy form of accompaniment is just small talk. And a lot of people have a negative view of small talk. I do not. I like small talk because when we're doing small talk, we're just getting used to each other and we're never going to feel safe with each other in the mind unless we, our bodies feel safe around each other. And so if we're talking about sports or w weather or whatever, I'm just getting a little to know you. And you got to go through that process of getting to know before you can feel safe and having a, a deeper conversation. Another thing that I just think is super valuable is play. I mentioned my friend Pete and I, we played basketball, we played softball, we did all this stuff. Well, play is, we're natural. We're not overly self-conscious, but we're high-fiving, trash talk, passing the ball. And I know people who play basketball, a weekly basketball game, they may have never had a deep conversation in their life, but they'd probably surrender their lives for each other because in play, they've really become close friends. I had an episode that reminded me of how powerful play has in my own family uh, my oldest was at the time like 14 months old we were living in brussels and he got up at 4 a.m and i didn't go off to work till 10 a.m so we had six hours of play every morning while i or at least he played while i tried to sleep um but i remember once when he was about 14 months old i he, i looked at him and i thought i probably know him better than i've ever known anybody and he probably knows me better than 
anybody's ever known me because I've been so open and emotional while playing with his trains. And we'd never said a word to each other because he couldn't talk. And so it was that that act of play prepares you for the stages of when you can really have the deeper conversations. So it is a gradual process and you, you can't rush it. Yeah. Uh, so, so many questions and apologies to all of you who are uh, asking them. We will not be able to get to, to all of them, but uh, there's a question from an anonymous viewer asking, how much do you think of marital discord is due to the inability to actually see each other? Yeah, I think when you have a couple that, one of the things I learned is you you quoted that statistic from a guy named William Ickes that uh, when we meet somebody where you see the other person accurately only 22% of the time, that same researcher found that the longer people are married, the less they see each other. Uh, not always, but typically. And that's because they have an early model in their head of who that person was. And then over the years, the person changed and they haven't updated their models. And so you, even though you can be married to somebody for a long time, you can still be kind of oblivious about their deepest desires or you know how the wounds of their childhood show up. And a lot of marriage really is like reminding people of who, who I am right now. And, and a lot of it is that sort of communication of who, here's who I am right now. Here's my desires right now. Uh, and here's how childhood is affecting how I see this right now. And so I do think one of the reasons marriages suffer is people become strangers to each other. Uh, and um, it's in having intentional conversations is a skill. And how many times have you gone off? I always tell my students, marriage is a 50 year conversation. Talk someone, you talk, marry someone you want to talk to for the rest of your life. You do not want to be that couple in Applebee's who sit there silently with each other. Um, you, you, and so pick someone you want to talk to all the time. Then the other bit of advice I give them is uh, love comes and goes, but admiration stays. Uh, mm -hmm. Pick someone you admire. Uh, and if you admire the person, then you'll always have a sweet, soft spot for them, even if you fight. <laughs> <laughs> We'll take one more question from Elizabeth Yerksa, who asked if you could talk a little bit more about the idea that people are not problems to be solved, but creatures to be loved. Yeah, we want to fix people. And everyone comes to us with their flaws and their brokenness. Uh, and it just doesn't work that way. <laughs> people will only change after they feel understood. Uh, and so, you know, I had a, a friend who had a daughter in second grade, and she was struggling. And the teacher said to her, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that little comment turned the girl's whole year around because suddenly she thought this weakness, uh, social awkwardness, suddenly, oh, no, that's a strength. I'm thoughtful. Uh, and so she wasn't fixing her. She was just seeing some potential in her. And we, we try to give each other the personalities we can go with the reputations we can then go live into. And so I'll close with this, the, there's a scene from a movie I hope everybody's seen called Goodwill Hunting. And in that movie, the Robin Williams character pulls the Matt Damon character out to a pond. And the Matt Damon character has been this math whiz the whole movie. But the Robin Williams character says, you know, I ask you about war. You probably quote Shakespeare once more into the breach. I ask you about peace. You probably quote or love. You probably quote me a sonnet. But you've never been in a war and you've never been vulnerable with a woman. So when I look at you, I don't see a confident man. I see a scared kid. And there's nothing you, about you that I can't learn in some book. And then he says, unless you want to talk about you, who you really are, then I'm fascinated. And But you don't want to do that because you don't know what you might say. And in that speech, the Robin William character is doing something to me profound. He's like saying, first, I see the thing that you're most trying to hide, which is you're terrified of life. I see that I put it on the table and it's going to be okay. And then he says, and plus I'm going to critique you with care. I'm going to direct you in a way that where you can fix yourself. And all I have to do is point out that there are two types of knowledge. There's the technical knowledge we learn in books and the personal knowledge we learn from emotional openness, from actual relationships, from actual experiences. And so all the Robin Williams characters doing saying, you're really good at book knowledge. You're not so good on this other kind. And in the movie, the Matt Damon characters, he launches off in life to be better at the other kind. It's a beautiful example of listening well and then critiquing with care, not trying to fix, just trying to say, here's how I see you from a position of unconditional love. David, that's great. And in just a moment, I want to give you the last word. Uh, but before that, a few things just to share with all of you who are watching. 
first, immediately after we conclude, we'll be sending around a feedback form. Really encourage you to fill it out. We always read these. Uh, we try to take the advice to heart to make this an ever more valuable program. And as a small incentive, and thank you for filling out that feedback form, we will give you a code for a free Trinity Forum reading download of your choice. There are several that we would recommend that are germane to our discussion. Uh, one, The Long Loneliness, to which David and his wife Anne wrote the introduction, uh, but also from authors that we've actually discussed today. Victor Frankel's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, uh, Simone Weil's uh, work, Wrestling with God, uh, as well as others, Augustine's Confections and On Friendship that we'd recommend uh, that pertain to today's discussion. In addition, for those of you who signed up for our post-event discussion groups, after this webinar is over, you can just exit it as you normally would, and then click on the link that was sent to you this morning via email to enter those discussion groups. If you haven't signed up for them and you want to participate, there should be a link in the chat feature where you can join us for the next 45 minutes to talk through with others some of what we've talked about here today with David. In addition, Tomorrow, we will be sending out around noon a follow-up email that gives additional readings, resources, and as well as a video to today's online conversation uh, to help one go deeper with some of the things that we've discussed, as well as share this discussion with others. So be on the lookout. And finally, we want to invite all of you who are watching to join the Trinity Forum Society, which is the community of people who help advance Trinity Forum's mission of cultivating, curating, and disseminating the best of Christian thought for the common good. In addition to being part of the community, there's a number of advantages to joining the Trinity Forum Society, including a subscription to our quarterly readings, our daily what we're reading list of curated reading recommendations, and as a special incentive for any new members of the Trinity Forum Society, or with your gift of $100 or more, we will send you a signed copy of David's excellent book, How to Know a Person. So we'd love to have you join us. For those of you who are in D.C., if you are around next week on Monday, October 30th, we'll actually be hosting historian and presidential biographer Ron White on the unlikely heroism of Joshua Chamberlain. And stay tuned for far more upcoming online conversations, including on December 1st with Tish Harrison Warren on Advent. Finally, if you are not always able to join our online conversations, we do make these available by, via podcast as well, which are released later. This coming Tuesday, our next podcast released will be with Bonnie Christian on Trust, Truth, and the Knowledge Crisis, and hope you'll be able to join us for that. Finally, as promised, David, the last word is yours. First, I want to encourage people to join so they can get your daily, what what we're reading. But the, that daily email organizes my reading list every day. So I, I appreciate what the Trinity Forum does with that. Uh, so my book is meant to be practical. So I'll finish just with two practical hit tips. And this is how to be a better conversationalist tips. Uh, and one of them is don't be a topper. So if you tell me something you're having trouble with your teenage son, my instinct is to say, oh, I know exactly what you're going through. I'm having a trouble with my teenage son. And that seems like I'm just trying to relate to you. But really, I'm saying, I don't really care about your problem. Let me talk about mine. And so that's called topping. Don't be a topper. And then the final one, I don't know if this will work with a... So uh, don't fear the pause. And so I read this from a book by Kate Murphy. Um, and she says, if I'm talking to you, and if there's a visual here, which is my arm sticking out. Um, if I'm talking to you and I start my comment at the sh shoulder and I talk all over my fingertips, at what point have you stopped listening so you can think of what you're going to say in response? Usually people stop right about here. And so my advice is, let me talk to my fingertips. And then I have a friend who does this. He, he'll hold up his hand and he'll pause for three or four seconds as he tries to think of what's to say. And I always feel, wow, he's really listening to me hard if he's really pausing. You don't want to do it all the time. If you're hanging around a bar, you want the conversation to be fast and fluid. But, but if it's a deep conversation or something important, then don't fear the pause. Let me talk to my fingertips, pause, and then think of what to say. And that way you'll really, really hear me. David, thank you so much. This has been a real delight. No, oh, thank you, Sheree. Always a pleasure to be with you. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Have a great weekend.